All righty, we'll get started then. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn how to save up to 90% and run production workloads on spot. I'm happy to be joined by Nicholas Silva, infrastructure lead at If This Then That, uh, and Will White, the CIO of Mapbox. Uh, and to introduce myself, my name is Boyd McGeeky. Uh, I do technical business development for our EC2 spot business. So today we're going to go through, uh, and I'll get you up to speed really quickly on the fundamentals of spot. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Will so that he can take us through some of the learnings, uh, warts and all, on how they got to a point where they can run in production on spot. Uh, and then I'll uh, go through some of the new tooling that we've got uh, that if this, then that has been capitalizing on uh, over the last 12 months. And then Nicholas will come up and take us through the challenges, uh, the good and the bad of, of how to make use of those tools as well. So first and foremost, we're here to talk about EC2 spot and how it can save you up to 90% uh, off your EC2 bill. But let's not forget, it isn't the answer to all of your questions. We do have multiple business models. Uh, and you know, what we like to say is you should be trying to have a balanced meal. It's a matter of having a combination of all three of these business models to get the absolute most out of EC2 and get the most bang for your buck. Uh, so quick overview, on demand, you know, pay for compute. It's a set rate. Once you get it, we're never going to take it off you. You can run it for as long as you'd like. Reserved instances, an opportunity to, to make a commitment to Amazon, and we'll make a commitment back to you that we'll have that capacity available, and we'll also give you a significant discount up to 70 75%. And then finally, Spot. Spot is our unused EC2 capacity uh, that where we let the market determine the price. And so with Spot, the rules are relatively simple. As I said, there is a minimum price that you're going to pay, normally around about 90% off, and then the market changes based on supply and demand. Supply is unused on-demand capacity, and the demand is spot customers, and then obviously also on-demand customers, because they can shrink that total supply curve. The way spot works is you bid on this capacity, okay? And the way the bidding mechanism works is very important. You never pay more than what you bid, but in fact, you very rarely pay your bid. You pay the prevailing market rate. So what that means is if you bid $1 for an instance and the current market rate is 10 cents, you pay 10 cents for that instance. Then if the market rate goes up and it changes based on the supply and demand mechanism and the price goes up, let's say, to a dollar and ten cents, we give you a two-minute warning uh, to do whatever you can, wrap up your work, detach yourself from a load balancer, tell your scheduler, hey, I'm going down, uh, and then we relatively unceremoniously will take that server away from you. So one of the most important things to understand about Spot, and these are sort of, I go through the two really important ninja tips here uh, before you get started with Spot. The most important thing actually is almost irrelevant from Spot or separate from Spot entirely, and that's how we deploy capacity and how it makes itself available to our customers. Um, so most people normally will recognize, hey, you've got multiple availability zones that are different clusters of data centers. So pretty quickly you'll work out, well, they're obviously going to have different supply of unused capacity and probably a different price point as well. Okay, so that's what we're representing up here. We've got 1A, 1B, 1C. So that's a region that has three availability zones. Uh, again, hopefully you can pretty quickly work out the price is going to be different there. And then let's just take one instance family, right? C3, hopefully everybody's familiar with the C3 instance class. It's a compute intensive uh, instance family that we want launched several years ago now. In that family, uh, there's five different sizes and then those three availability zones. Each of these markets is completely independent from one another which means the price that you pay and the availability of these instances is completely independent for spot customers. Now, this is super important because what I'm going to talk about is this idea that instance flexibility is king when it comes to leveraging spot in production. And certainly, you're going to hear the same thing from, from these gentlemen shortly, I'm sure. Uh, and the reason I raise this at this point, this instance flexibility concept, is what I'll say to you is you're almost certainly more instance flexible than you think right now. Because what a lot of customers will say is, no, Boyd, there's no way I could use uh, a different instance type. I've optimized for C3 for Excel. And then I'll say to them, well, if we go look at C3, well, not that one, ignore the tile that just spun. If we look at C3 8XL in 1B, you'll notice that's actually cheaper than the C3 for Excel in 1B, because the price is determined by supply and demand, and they're independent curves. So surely, surely, if I gave you double the compute, double the disk, double the memory, double the network, it's not going to break your application. And if it's still a 70, 75% discount, then the cost of running C3 for Excel is on demand. I really hope you're not still going to sit there and tell me there's no way I'm not instance flexible. So when, I, when we're talking about instance flex, flexibility, remember significant discounts come along with this. So it changes how you should think about flexibility in instances. OK, the, the, next, the next super important thing 
is the fact that, I've already made this point, you do not pay uh, your bid, you pay the current market rate. And so if we do a quick simulation here, we've got one instance, the R34XL uh, in US East 1D running for a week. And we said, you know, if we bid just a quarter of the on-demand price, what would I, how many times would I have been interrupted and what would I have actually paid? What would have been the discount that I achieved throughout this period? So every time the green line breaks through that black line, that was a time when we would have given you a two-minute warning and we would have taken the instance away from you. So four or five times throughout the week, you would have been interrupted. But you would have gotten a discount of 86%. So pretty compelling discount, I'm sure. But I have few interruptions that you're going to have to handle. Well, what about if we bid 50% of on-demand? If we bid 50% of on-demand, hopefully it's pretty obvious the green line breaks through it only once now. So one interruption in a week. But because we do not pay our bid, we pay the prevailing market rate, I got a discount of 85%. So negligible change in the discount I achieved, but I was able to go down from four or five interruptions to just one. Final simulation. What about if I bid 75% of the on-demand price? I can't show you the on-demand price because it, it never went to that price throughout this week. But if I bid 75% of the on-demand price, not one interruption in the entire week, and the discount was still 85%. So the discount didn't change. So Ninja tip number two, no capacity pools is the first one. Understand that there are multiple capacity pools and we, we don't run out of spot. We run out of specific capacity pools from time to time. Um, the second ninja tip is just bid around about the on-demand price when you're getting started. You're going to ride out most of the interruptions. It's very, you're, you're unlikely to get interrupted particularly often. The price can go above on-demand, so you could still be interrupted, but you're going to ride out any of these small fluctuations and you're going to get an awesome discount. Okay, you're going to get a significant discount uh, almost the exact same as you'd get if you spent a lot of time working out what's the optimal bidding strategy. So just bid the on-demand price. And then last slide before I hand over, hand over to Will. I want to run you through quickly, uh, and this is going to be a recurring theme that we'll see, which is, okay, so we're going to become instance flexible. We understand that. What else do I need to do to make use of spot? You need to be stateless. You need to be fault tolerant. You should be multi-AZ if possible, because that's standard EC2 best practice, right? Uh, you should be loosely coupled, if at all possible, as well. And again, these are EC2 best practices. These are probably things that you're aspiring to achieve regardless of whether you're looking at whether you can make use of EC2 spot. So all that I'm going to ask you to do, once you've gone and done the fundamentals, once you've done the best practice for cloud, is introduce some instance flexibility to make use of spot. And with that, I'll hand over to Will. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Boyd. Um, and thanks for, for having me to, to speak today. Uh, I, uh, my name's Will. I work at Mapbox. I'm on the platform team. And, and Mapbox is about um, uh, adding location to any application. So we make uh, customizable services uh, that, that make it easy for developers to add location to their apps. Um, that, that includes things like maps, which uh, help you see the world in stunning detail, geocoding or, or search that helps you find uh, places and addresses and, and things like directions, which helps you get from point A to point B. Um, all of our tools are delivered as, as a developer-friendly SDKs, and um, that, that can really just drop right into an app, and, and you can start integration really quickly. And uh, together, our goal is, the, the, the goal with the tools is to help change the way people move around the world. Uh, we're powering over 55,000 applications, um, uh, ranging from in categories from social to, to mobility, and uh, some of the biggest brands uh, on the web, uh, with 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 uh, over a quarter billion users uh, every month, unique users every month, and that number is growing. Um, the, those, those brands include uh, the Weather Channel. So they use our SDK to render uh, animated satellite and radar maps, and they also use our, our search, our geocoder, to help people find the weather for locations quickly. Um, Airbnb, they use us on the web, uh, and they use a custom marker to help people see where property is available to rent. Uh, CNN helps people understand where news is happening with a, with a custom satellite layer and a, and a custom uh, street map layer that's optimized for data visualization. And uh, finally, uh, someone like National Geographic, uh, they have a, a gorgeous city guides app that 
um, helps guide people on walking tours of, of the world's most iconic cities. So these are a few of our customers that, that uh, use Mapbox and sort of give you a sense of how they use Mapbox. And in order to power these, these use cases, we, we need to process a lot of data. Um, so uh, what we're doing is we're taking data from uh, the quarter, bil uh, qu quarter billion users who are using our SDK, and we're anonymizing that, aggregating that data, and snapping it to the no road network to identify missing streets, to uh, build uh, traffic profiles so we know where uh, traffic congestion is over time, both uh, historic and real time. Um, and so the maps are made of, of uh, billions of individual points. And we need to uh, aggregate these points and uh, snap them through the road network so that we have clean, smooth, uh, lines that, that uh, we can turn into a map or turn into a traffic profile. So those billions of points uh, end up turning into these, uh, these uh, very, very detailed uh, geometries that, that even go down in this example to the lane, the lane level. And we're collecting about 100 million miles worth of data every day. So uh, billions of points cleaned up, filtered, translates into about 100 million miles of, of road network coverage every day. So at its core, um, it, it extends beyond those, those uh, probe points. Um, we, we work with other types of sensor data as well. So at its core, Mapbox works by taking sensor data, that's the data from our SDK, data from vehicles, data from satellites, drones, whatever, and processing it into a format that is consumable on our API. So um, it all starts with, with Amazon Kinesis. Uh, we process that data, uh, stream that data through Kinesis, uh, to consumers, and those consumers are typically running uh, on a spot fleet uh, or an auto scaling group. Um, so then that data is delivered to our persistence layer. So we have our, uh, for persistence, we're typically using DynamoDB or, uh, or, or S3. And then finally, we serve that data back out, that process data, we serve that back out using, uh, again, spot fleet um, or, or auto scaling. We use um, Route 53 and CloudFront to accelerate our uh, optimized uh, load balance to different regions. We're running in 10 different regions. We'll talk about that in a second. And, uh, and also just to CloudFront to accelerate our API. So as far as compute goes, uh, our compute hours in the last year has increased by over 1,000% uh, compared to the previous year. Um, and we're on track to do over 500 million hours of compute this year. Um, it's a pretty, pretty massive amount of, uh, pretty massive amount of data processing, and that's both on the data processing side and on the API side. So, uh, whether we're ingesting data uh, and and getting it ready to serve out, or we're actually serving it out to customers like the Weather Channel. So, despite this this massive uh, amount of computing, um, our margins actually increased, and um, the way we accomplished this was with Spot. Um, so here's a little look at how that actually looks. This is the, uh, the top graph is the number of compute hours that, that we're doing over this time period. I think this is 30 days. Uh, sorry, no, this is like, this is three months. And meanwhile, you see some, some fluctuation as we're testing things out, but overall, our, you're not seeing the hockey stick growth curve that you see on the top graph. The bottom graph is the cost, what we actually spend. Um, so pretty, pretty incredible how we're able to actually increase our margins, reduce COGS, um, and, and optimize uh, using Spot. Spot's really enabling, in this case, enabling things that us to do this processing, and it just wouldn't be possible otherwise. You know, we wouldn't actually be able to build some of the products that we have um, without, without Spot enabling it with uh, the cost savings. So a lot of the times, uh, this is sort of going back to what Boyd was talking about a couple minutes ago, a lot of, I get this question a lot. Um, you know, how much did you have to change about your infrastructure in, in order to switch to Spot? Well, luckily for us, we were sort of born in the cloud. Um, we've been using Amazon since 2007, um, and so we, we sort of have evolved as, as, as we've gone, and we've followed those best practices that, that Boyd has talked about. Um, so the answer is really, uh, if you, whether you're starting something new and building from the ground up, or you're um, trying to migrate a system to AWS, um, the general rule is to just follow best, general best practices for using uh, EC2, for using AWS, 
uh, and, and it makes it much, much easier to use spot instances. So those best practices, um, from my perspective, are uh, diversification is, is critical. Diversify across availability zones. So, like, use those availability zones. Diversify across regions. This is, we do this for, not only for diversification purposes, but we're running in 10 different regions all around the world for performance. You know, the latency between uh, here and uh, Australia uh, is not insignificant. So we, in order to provide a good quality of service for those uh, customers in Australia, we need to have a Sydney region running. But the nice thing about that is it also gives us a, a whole new dimension of diversity. Um, and also diversify the types of instances that you use, as, as Boyd was talking about. Um, second one I, I'll mention is reduce your cold start time. Um, so that means uh, making, uh, introducing more statelessness into your application where possible, and simply having your application be able to come to life and start handling requests or processing data or whatever you're doing, make that happen faster. Um, and uh, finally, break up, breaking up uh, large jobs into, into smaller pieces. So, so I'll walk through each of these. Um, so we, as, I, as I mentioned, we have those 10, 10 isolated regions. As more regions come online, um, use those. Um, and multiple availability zones. Each region has at least two availability zones. And uh, the, the markets are, are segmented along that dimension. So uh, you'll, you're, you're going to be less susceptible to price spikes uh, in the, or, or other types of uh, uh, outages or incidents if you simply spread your application across multiple availability zones and, and multiple instance types as well. Um, Spot Fleet is a great tool for this. Uh, you can use this for bidding on, on multiple instance types very easily. And um, ECS is an incredible tool for this. I think if you're thinking about moving an application or building a new application, definitely, definitely uh, use Docker and ECS because it makes that, that uh, the challenge of running an application on any type of instance uh, much, much easier to overcome. Uh, so, and ECS handles all of the uh, sort of scheduling complexities. Uh, we built a tool uh, as well, in addition to Spot Fleet, we also built a tool that helps us um, activate uh, backup on-demand capacity. So this is mainly for, uh, this can be used for data processing uh, on the data processing side of things, but we mainly are using this on our API because our API needs to be uh, highly available, HA. And in order to have it uh, be HA, we, it always has to be online. So basically we built a system that allows us to to use the termination notifications that are available from within uh, each spot instance. We can detect when, when an instance is about to be terminated with a two minute warning. We tag that instance, and then we uh, run a Lambda function that uh, does some heuristics over which instances are tagged, and we can figure out if uh, we're getting to a point where uh, we need to spin up on-demand capacity to, uh, to stay online. So this is sort of our, uh, our absolute backup plan if our spot fleet starts to lose capacity uh, too quickly uh, we we have we can sleep well at night knowing that um, our on-demand capacity will come in and temporarily backfill uh, at a higher price um, our, our spot capacity uh, and the nice thing about this is that when the spot, uh, when a spot interruption uh, interruption ends we will shut down the more expensive on-demand instances and we'll we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to spot. So this is what this looks like is a little animation. Um, we got the blue, it's our spot instances, and the, um, the orange is our, our, the on-demand instances. And as we lose those spot instances, we start up um, on-demand instances. And you can see our price, our average price in the top left goes up. And then as we recover, it goes back down, um, our pr average price per hour. Um, so this is a, a tool we've built uh, internally, and that's, uh, but it's a pretty straightforward thing to, to do, and it's a, a very, very useful technique. Okay, uh, reducing your cold start time. Um, this is, again, ECS is a great tool for this. Um, 
bake, baking your software uh, into an AMI, um, whatever software you need to uh, load onto your EC2, bake that into an AMI, or better yet, a Docker, a Docker image to get that on the instance uh, very fast. Minimize state, so if you can avoid using the disks on the uh, EC2 if possible. So a, a lot of our API is backed by DynamoDB, it's backed by S3 or uh, Kinesis or something like ElastiCache. Um, minimizing state on the instance so that we have more stateless machines, this is gonna just make your, your instance boot time faster. And the goal should be to bootstrap in less than two minutes because that's what that termination notification is. If you can get faster than that, that's, that's even better. Uh, and once again, another plug for ECS. Um, you can deploy in seconds instead of minutes with ECS, and, and this has been um, this this is important when every um, when every second counts. Uh, the next the next best practice is breaking up large jobs. This applies square this firmly on the data processing side of things, not so much on the API side, but the, the data processing side for sure. So a lot of people I see are, have, a, have very long running batch jobs that, that can take, you know, here's one that's like 15 hours, right? You can run it on an instance, it takes, gonna start to finish, it's gonna take 15 hours. What if you take that same job and you find a way to break it up into smaller chunks? And then you can arbitrarily distribute that job across, instead of one instance, three instances. Um, and that reduces your time to five hours. You still use you still use the same amount of computing hours, um, but uh, the the benefit is that you can iterate faster. So if you're working on data processing software, you can iterate on that software a lot faster. And um, uh, the you can sort of control how quickly the work gets done. So you don't have to wait. Uh, 15 hours, you can have it be done in five hours or one hour if you want. You just have to scale up horizontally. The other advantage here with short jobs is that it minimizes the blast radius of a, of a failure. So let's take that 15 hour job and you look at the failure that occurs where that red line is, um, you're gonna lose, what, 14 and a half hours worth of work and you have to go back to the beginning and start over. Um, if you can break up your jobs into smaller pieces, you're checkpointing more often, and then uh, if you look at what, what's lost in this situation, it's very, very minimal, um, and you can just pick right back up where you, where you left off. Um, and in the long run, it saves even more money, so uh, this is just a great architecture decision. Just to really drive this point home, I wanted to walk through an example of what you know, one way we would think about breaking up a, a file. This works with images, works with a few other uh, types of files, but the easiest one, of course, is, is as always, is a text file. So take a text file with 10 million lines uh, of log messages or something like that, uh, and let's say you want to process it in batches of 10,000 uh, lines. So you just take the total number of lines, divide by 10,000, generate an SQS message for each, uh, each of those 10,000 line chunks, so that gives you a thousand messages. Um, Lambda is a great way to actually do that. So we have, we use Lambda. We'll send a file to a Lambda function. Have Lambda Lambda count the lines in a file, for example, and then have Lambda fire off uh, bulk messages into SQS to generate those a thousand messages. It's a really um, nice way to have a sort of a serverless uh, utility for creating those jobs. And then once, once a, a worker actually starts, grabs one of those jobs from the queue, from the work queue, um, just have them download the, they all download the same file, it's the only difference is they start reading, uh, you know, at whatever specified line that, that has been instructed in the job. So um, everybody has the same file, it's just that they're reading different parts of the, of the file. And this ends up, um, ends up allowing you to distribute arbitrarily across a, a lot more EC2s. So, um, and, then, and then of course, deliver the output to S3. Any reduce operation that you need to do, you can sort of do as a, as a final step. You know, so you're gonna end up on, with, with 10,000 outputs, or sorry, 1,000 outputs, one for each message, sitting on S3, and you can sort of do a reduce operation where you um, roll that up into to something, something final. So overall, the, the impact um, uh, of our usage of Spot has been, has been pretty incredible. Um, between the use of Spot Fleet and uh, Spot Swap, the tool we built internally as the backup, uh, Spot interruptions are, are generally pretty rare, and um, we're, we normally see 
uh, the fallback being tr triggered one to two times a month. Um, and actually, these slides are a little old. I think, uh, uh, like, we haven't seen a spot interruption in, in quite a long time because we've been running on a lot of distributed uh, instance types. Um, most of the time, you know, 98% of the time, we're running on discounted spot instances, and we're seeing 90% savings in EC2 costs each month, and that's just on our map service alone. If you look at all the other services, the, the savings uh, vary a little bit, but 90% 90, 90 is, is pretty typical for what, what we've been seeing. Um, I want to wrap up uh, my segment here with a, a little bit of a, a couple cost gotchas, especially when it comes to data processing. Um, when you get, start getting in the hang of using Spot and you're used to having uh, really, really cheap access to EC2s, you're gonna wanna run a lot of them. And uh, one thing to watch out for is any cost that isn't discounted along with Spot that uh, is applied per instance. So this is things like uh, little costs that add up, like uh, detailed monitoring is one that, um, that we, you know, it's like, oh, it's, uh, uh, half a cent per hour on, on an EC2. Sure, turn it on. We had it on on every single EC2 in our uh, in our fleet. We had it on by default. And then when we started running thousands and thousands of instances uh, or doing two million hours worth of computing in a in a week or a month, uh, it adds up very quickly. So uh, heads up on those ty types of costs. Turn off uh, uh, if you can. Turn off detailed monitoring because you know you'll, you'll end up with a big bill. Uh, and finally, uh, the EBS volumes <clears throat> still still build at full price on spot. Um, so that's, that includes instance EBS volumes that you attach to an instance using a like a block mapping, block device mapping, or even if you're using a, a EBS root volume, those are still charged at full price. So think about, let's say you have an on-demand instance that you normally get for you know 60 cents an hour. If you're getting that for five cents or 10 cents an hour your EBS volume is still gonna be full price. So watch out if you spin up a 1,000 instances, um, your EBS bill, uh, keep it under control by using Instant Store. Um, that's what we use across the board for both our API and uh, data processing. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Boyd. Thank you. For those wondering, um, the EBS root volume, if you turn on 10,000 servers and then they get terminated, we, we terminate the EBS volumes for you as well because we don't want you to have to waste time uh, going back and terminating them. That's a peculiarity of Spot. So hopefully Will's got you excited about some of the prospects of, of Spot. So if you're thinking, well, what would I do next? If I've never used Spot before, I've never had an experience with Spot, what do I do next? What's the first thing I do uh, if I've got my phone open right now? I'd encourage you to go uh, and Google EC2 Spot Bid Advisor, okay? The Spot Bid Advisor is a tool that we built early last year to help customers um, discover the instances that uh, suit them. Um, so it's a tool where you can put in the minimum specifications for your application and what would you be willing to pay uh, as a percentage of on-demand, and then we'll spit out not only the discount that you would have achieved, but also what was the average lifetime of that instance over the last month and last week. And that's the two columns that we see here. Uh, so we're saying it in North California, uh, in the US West one region, if I was looking at Linux and I was willing to pay just 50% of on-demand, no more than that, remember what I bid is not what I pay, what I bid is the maximum I'm willing to pay. And I said, I need a server that has at least four uh, vCPUs uh, and seven gigs of memory. Well, what you can see is there's a whole host that show up as low, that meet or exceed those specifications. What low means is not once during the analysis period would you have been interrupted. So we can see there some low instances showing up for both month and week, okay? So when you're thinking about the, the workloads that may be suitable for this and you're thinking, I can handle interruption, but I can't handle regular interruption. It can't be happening every 20 minutes, otherwise my batch job would never finish. Come and sanity check your thoughts, because what you'll find is a lot of spot instances live for a significantly longer time than that. And we can see down that middle column, uh, all of these lows are showing up as 91, 91, 82, 81, and 89% discount over the on-demand price. So when you're starting to think, how do I get started? How do I have a good experience with spot first go round? Go to the spot bid advisor, check it out. Um, and then what you'll see is, well, there could be many. And Boyd stood up here and Will stood up here as well and told you diversity is so important. And so how do I handle that diversity? How do I deal with that in an automated fashion? Because we know that nobody wants to stay up at night uh, you know, managing flipping auto-scaling groups and, and making sure that the right instance is running at the right time. Um, 
Before I get to that, I do just want to quickly show you a version of that tool that you can also run inside your own account. So there are many workloads. A really good example is Hadoop. I mean, EMR will restrict you to a single AZ by default. Uh, and so you might want to run this analysis inside your own account with the specific instances and the specific zone that you're going to launch into and say, hey, how long would I have lived for over the last week or month or whatever analysis you want to do? And we'll spit out uh, a number that says, this is a very friendly picture uh, that I've selected here. It says, over the last week, uh, 168 means seven days, seven times 24. So not once would any of these instances have been interrupted over the last week had I bid the on-demand price for them. You can do that yourself. You can run this query inside your own account and get very specific uh, so that you can start discovering the servers that will work for you. Um, so what about handling the complexity of deploying and managing a diverse array of instances? Last year, we launched a tool called SpotFleet that was designed to do exactly that. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Amazon auto-scaling groups. This is a very similar tool in that uh, you, know, you don't pay any additional cost to make use of the orchestration service. The difference being this was an orchestration tool that was designed from the ground up with spot best practices in mind. So that you can define um, the rules that it's going to play by. You can set the instances that it should use, the AZs it should use, the subnets, whatever it is. You define the rules, and then you can step back and say, now go get me 100. That could be go get me 100 instances, go get me a terabyte of memory, go get me 1,000 cores. Whatever you want, you can define the rules uh, that it will play by and then pass over responsibility to discover and deploy that uh, spot capacity for you to it. Now, this doesn't mean you won't get interrupted from time to time. You know, these are still just standard spot instances that this tool is orchestrating. What it does mean is we're going to take responsibility when an interruption occurs to go, oop, we've lost one of our 10 options. Let's rebalance to one of the remaining nine so we can get back up to the capacity that you desire rapidly. So we're saying, you know, stateless systems, systems that you can handle interruption as long as you recover quickly, there's a fantastic tool that's going to work for you very well. There's two modes that you can deploy into. Um, best price, which, oh, yeah, best price is just pretty obvious by the name. We're going to find the one instance according to your rules that's the cheapest right now, and we're going to try and deploy all of the capacity right there. So great for, you know, uh, short run jobs for batch jobs where you don't mind putting all of your eggs in one basket so that you can get the best price. Now the challenge being, if that price goes up and interrupts you, you're going to lose all of that capacity at once. And so that's why we introduced the diversified deployment pattern. The diversified deployment pattern you can think of as just sort of investing you know, across a portfolio of stocks and you say, here's you know, 10 instances that I'm willing to use, or let's say five instances across two zones that I'm willing to use, deploy across all of them that are currently in the money. By doing so, we're spreading out across multiple supply and demand pools with completely independent price points. So the likelihood of multiple pools being interrupted at the same time shrinks drastically. So now we're in a position where we might be saying, well, I'm running a website. I can handle losing 10% of my cluster as long as I recover it immediately. Um, and by deploying across 10 pools, that's exactly what's going to happen. We're minimizing the blast radius of a spot interruption, and we're immediately recovering from that spot interruption and redeploying where other spot instances are available. We're doing all of that for you. You just define the rules at the outset, and then we take over that responsibility and do it for you. Um, and I, I sort of uh, mentioned this earlier, that the array of instances that you'd be willing to use, you can give them all a score. So that might be, hey, I can deploy one container on a large, so I can deploy two containers on an extra large. It might be, I just care about vCPUs. Go get me 10,000 vCPUs, and we'll just set it to that score. It could be memory. It could be disk. It could be some arbitrary metric that you just made up yourself. You can apply a custom weighting and then start scaling spot capacity based on what matters to your application. And we made it super easy. You just need to do all of this yourself. Um, so it does become a lot, right? You, you could end up with multiple options, and I think Nicholas will tell us about the, the many options that they started with when they began using Spot Fleet. It can become quite a big template. And so last year, we went out and we said, we've got to fix that. We created a console. And the thing I love about this console uh, from AWS is you can go through, define everything the first time, and then at the end, you can say, now download the template, download the JSON template. So go the first time, go to the Spot console, request your Spot Fleet, Build it uh, in Spot Fleet. This is a view of the console. You can go in there and say, so I'm going to pick the M42 extra large and the C42 extra large. Uh, I'm going to deploy it just in one AZ. This is in the, the new region in Mumbai, I believe. Define the rules, whatever it may be. And then you can actually set up this thing called automated bidding as well, where we'll just go, and it's, it's not that secret, right? We call it automated bidding. All it's doing is we're going to automatically set your bid price to the on-demand price. 
if you go back to what I said earlier, that's how you should get started. It's really going to be almost, almost all the time, it's the best strategy for customers. I'll tell you one thing. The only time that I deviate from that as a recommendation from customers is those that absolutely love interruptions. Now, that may sound really weird. But some customers have tasks that they've chunked down to just one minute, or even less than one minute. And so there's one customer from Australia where I, uh, where I grew up. And that customer has one minute tasks, so they go and they bid incredibly low. They're the 25% of on-demand bidder. Because if they get interrupted 55 minutes into the hour, they don't pay for that 55 minutes. So if you've got one minute tasks and you're interrupted 55 minutes into the hour, you just got 54 jobs done for free. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time helping you do that. <laughs> But if you can. So that's, spot, that's the uh, Spot Fleet console that you can go ahead and get, get started using. Um, you know, this is the sort of template you can see. Uh, we're just going to give you the graph. You can pick your instances, and then at the end, you can go and edit it to whatever the hell you want it to be. Um, but that's what Spot Fleet's going to do for you. It's going to help automate the complexity of being diversified. It's going to automate the complexity of following what I've just said. It's a spot best practice. All you need to do is spend a little bit of time Maybe do some benchmarking, maybe do some testing, and find the instances that work for you. And remember, when you're doing that benchmarking and testing, if it performs 10% worse, but it's a 90% discount, is it worth it? Almost certainly, surely, as opposed to having to invoke failing over to on-demand, as an example, which was a very common pattern um, back in the old days. Increasingly, the common pattern is failing from one spot instance to another. And again, go check the spot bid advisor. We talk about failing a lot because you do need to be ready for it if you're going to make use of Spot. It is going to happen at some point, but don't convince yourself it's going to happen 10 times a day. Go check the Spot Bid Advisor, sanity check your thoughts, and what you'll find is there's a huge number of instances that live for week, days, weeks, months on end without interruption. By the way, I didn't mention it, but if you are Googling the Spot Bid Advisor and checking it out, medium means the average lifetime was greater than two days. Okay? So I showed you the lows. That's no interruptions over the analysis period. Medium means greater than two days. So a huge number of workloads still can probably accept that, right? So diversification, just, just one last slide here. You know. Be serious about thinking about diversification. So many people want to put that to the side. You can put that to the side if you're going to run dev test and you add environments. You cannot put it to the side if you want to run in production consistently and successfully and get that 80 to 90% discount. You can fail over to on demand as often as you'd like. You can do that if you only want to use one instance. But I'd encourage you to explore diversification, which is why I'm saying it. Uh, so many times, and you're probably getting irritated by it. Um, you know, select multiple availability zones if you can. It's not compulsory. Again, EMR is a really a very common use case. Customers use EMR and Spot together all the time. We restrict you to a single zone. So instead of going across AZs, customers will go up and down families. They'll say, well, I can use the C3 2XL, 4XL, 8XL. And hey, because Spot prices are determined by supply and demand, I can use the R3 2XL, 4XL, and 8XL as well. Because oftentimes, the R3 large is going to be the same price as the C3 large. The prices are not correlated with on-demand. Very few applications are going to break if I give them 4x the memory you ask for. So who cares if we give you a little bit of extra resources if you're saving a fortune? Um, or you know, very common if you're running behind a load balancer, this is a, a very common example. You'll say, well, right now I'm running the C3, or let's say C4 large now. I'm running the C4 large in my web fleet uh, behind a load balancer, and it's stateless. Um, I don't want to run like an 8XL and a large at the same time because that just seems a little bit scary to put that behind a load balancer and hope that the right requests go to the right places that performs well. So instead, just go across families. You know, we can use you know, C3 large, M3 large, C4 large, M4 large, R3 large, whatever else it may be out there. Again, that, the example I made earlier, right? If you're using C4 large today, and you think, oh, yeah, but we really like this chipset. It performs so well for us. The C3 large performs a little bit worse. Ah, if it's the difference between failing over to on-demand and paying the on-demand price for C4 large versus taking that 10% hit and still getting an 80 to 90% savings with the C3, come on, do it. Save some money. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd, uh, for ha having me here. Uh, my name is Nicholas Silva. I'm the infrastructure lead at If This Then That, um, which, as you can see, it, our tagline is one connection, countless possibilities. We let developers and users create connections between different services, uh, Slack to Facebook, Facebook to Slack, Twitter to Facebook, uh, Alexa to Twitter, really pretty much anything that you can think of. And I'm sure someone will ask you, 
or uh, one of you will ask me later about applets. Oracle has uh, released the name. Uh, we've picked up the name applets recently, and we're calling our, uh, we used to call them recipes. We're calling them applets now, and they're essentially like little mini units of functionality. Here are some various examples of the types of things that our users and our partners have, have uh, created and then uh, allow other users to use. Um, we have 43 million applets that have been created, um, over 9 million users on our platform, 360 different services that we've launched. Um, an applet is defined as generally a set of triggers, which is like new data on a service, and then actions, which is posting data to another service, saving something to a spreadsheet. Uh, so we run over a billion actions per month and we check over a billion triggers per day. So if there's no new data, the action won't fire, but um, we, we have a, kind of a lot of bandwidth, and we have over 80 million service activations. We run all of this in one region, US East one, um, four availability zones, and one DevOps engineer. Um, so let's go back to 2014. If it was, or it was and still is running on Ruby on Rails, we had dedicated web instances running our website, and we had dedicated worker instances running the, the kind of like background processing jobs. Um, we, the worker instances were configured based on the, um, the size of the instance, um, uh, C4, uh, C3 at that time, C3 large could run 10 workers, uh, C3 8XL could run 100 workers or whatever it was. Um, and we were experimenting with Spot a little bit. We kind of had some elastic capacity because we were running at the time where during the day we had more load, so we would um, have a couple auto-scaling groups that would um, kind of like increase capacity. But then we actually started to depend upon that capacity every day, and we, were, uh, some, we would sometimes lose it when we needed it. We were saving about, on, for that pool, we, uh, we were saving about 50% on on-demand based on our, our bid, uh, but we were really vulnerable to market fl fluctuations. And um, more importantly, it, it just like, wasn't working out uh, for us the way that we wanted to. So that's where Spot Fleet came in. Um, we launched our worker AMI into Spot Fleet with a mix of markets, and that, just like before, that AMI was configured to scale based on whatever instance type it launched into, although I think it was only uh, the C class. Um, eventually, we moved all of our workers over to Spot Fleet Management because it was essentially reliable enough to, uh, for that type of workload. The, uh, talking about the batch processing jobs, it, it, generally each unit is about a minute, um, so, uh, and that's like multiple applets, checking the triggers, running the actions. Um, so. That, that worked pretty well for us. And it was good, but it wasn't great. We, we knew that our infrastructure was, was getting kind of old. We had these AMIs that were hanging around for a long time. Uh, when they would boot, they would have to fetch all of, all of the changes in, in code. It was kind of like a, a kludgy chef solo setup that, that worked with like a, a Dynamo-based deployment system called Deploynamo that we had written and that guy had left the company and, and it just really wasn't great. We knew that we had to like revitalize it, but we didn't really know where it was that we wanted to go. Um, and that was where we, when, when we basically jumped the ship into, um, into Docker, or I guess we jumped onto the Docker ship. Uh, so we, we worked over 2015 to create Docker containers uh, or Docker images for all of our various applications um, and get everything running in that stack. And at the same time, we were building a Mesos and Marathon based kind of container scheduling system. That at the time, like uh, Kubernetes was still kind of new at the end of 2014 and Mesos and Marathon was, was working. It involved a little bit of um, fiddling, but we, eventually got kind of a, a little magical AMI that uh, satisfied all of our needs. It, it um, integrates with our LDAP solution so that we can log into all of them. It installs versions of Docker that we need, a Mesos Marathon, and most importantly, has a, a boot flow that looks at the VPC that it's in, finds a tag on that VPC, then tags itself 
finds the Mesos leader to connect to and then registers with Mesos all uh, autonomously, which was important for our use of Spot Fleet because by this point, we had essentially become dependent upon Spot Fleet to run the amount of workload that we were running. I pulled out my phone um, while, um, or earlier, because I wanted to calculate the number of compute hours. And um, we're running about 2,500 cores at any, at any given time. So that works out to be just under 2 million um, hours per month and about uh, 22 million um, hours per year of compute. Um, so it's a lot, and we really would not be able to do it at all without Spot, uh, j just because of the savings. We um, have some reserved instances for Zookeeper and for the, the Mesos leaders, uh, which are set up in a high availability setup. The cluster itself of all of the followers is managed entirely by Spot Fleet. We launched it in 48 different availability zones in the US one region. We actually tried to launch it more, but the Spot Fleet engineers set an arbitrarily high um, uh, limit at 50. They didn't think that anybody would want more than 50 different spot pools. Uh, I think we wanted 80 or 70. And we were just like, anything. We'll, we'll run on anything. Our workers are, are Ruby on Rails containers. They don't care what they're running on. Really, all we needed was network because uh, our, our service is so much uh, network dependent. Um, the Ruby is memory hungry, but really we were network dependent. Um, and the, the, the rest of it was basically handled by Mesos. Um, we, after a while, we started to notice some kind of like irregularities with the way that we were um, uh, being allocated. So we looked at the, our memory and our CPU usage across the entire cluster. Um, pulled some graphs and charts. We calculated the maximum number of containers that we could fit into a particular instance, how much we were paying on that instance over the last month, and essentially um, kind of like optimized our setup and wound up saving a couple thousand dollars per month just by essentially reducing the number of spot pools that we were in. 48, it was great if we lost a spot pool, and we, that happens like all the time for us because we're utilizing them so heavily, we, uh, and when I say all the time, it's like once a week or something like that. We lose a 48th of our capacity, which is nothing. Mesos and Marathon will reroute the containers to our extra capacity, and it, it like, I don't even know. I don't even know anymore, because it doesn't bother me. It just is all happening in the background. So, but um, we, we wanted to make sure that we were as optimized as possible. So then we set instance weights and bid prices based on our custom calculation, just like you were saying. So um, the R class is not as useful for us. So we actually discounted those. Uh, we won't pay on-demand prices. Everything else we're willing to bid on-demand price just because we don't, we don't care. We, don't, uh, we know that we're going to be getting a significant discount, and we want the stability over any sort of, of interruption, um, even though it will happen from time to time. We also, it, it's real, what, one thing that's really nice about Spot Fleet is that the um, allocation metrics will be um, reported to, um, to CloudWatch. So you can see how many instances are launching, how many instances are currently running, instances terminated. And then I wrote a little bash script to uh, one for Mesos and one for Marathon to basically just collect the metrics from the marathon leader and then publish that to CloudWatch so that uh, we could correlate those graphs and see how many of our total CPU is being allocated to workers and how much of our total memory is being allocated and kind of like um, correlate those until we get our uh, bin packing strategy kind of like optimized. Um, we estimate that we're saving about 75% less than if we were using on demand. Part of that is that we, we build in a buffer so that uh, we can handle a deploy. We do uh, marathon-based rolling deploys of new containers. So we kind of want buffer so that we don't have to continually be taking our service down to uh, down in capacity to launch new instances. Um, but the bin packing certainly helped. We were, were utilizing our resources way more. Spot Fleet manages our capacity automatically. Like I said, I don't know really when we've got a Spot Fleet interruption because unless it's super, super serious, I won't even notice. There'll just be a little squiggle on the graph of the number of 
of uh, total cores that we have. Uh, and I don't even know how many instances we have because it could be 200, it could be 400. If we lose some in one kind of class, we might, or spot fleet, the diversified allocator might launch more instances in another class to make up our total uh, requested number of like arbitrary units. Uh, but the, one of the best things is with this entire thing, with Mesos Marathon, Docker, and Spot Fleet, is that this infrastructure abstraction has actually freed up our developers to just build the thing that they want to build instead of having to worry about what type of instance it's going to run on, how much memory it's going to get. Um, our data analytics team is able to launch uh, long-running um, kind of like pipeline jobs. And they run through the night. They very rarely ever get interrupted. And, and even when they do, they've, they've checkpointed them. And so they might have lost about an hour's worth of, of uh, analytics processing. But it's, it's really not a big deal. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, I mean, hopefully there's a, an obvious and recurring pattern that you've seen here. If you're looking at Docker as, as part of the future of your compute, um, you know, two examples where Docker has, has drastically reduced the complexity to follow spot best practices. It's, it's certainly not just uh, Dockerized uh, services, you know, whether it be microservices, data processing, um, you know, I've mentioned EMR and, and Hadoop many times. They've been very popular for a long time. Really anything that has a, a resource manager uh, that's able to make use of, of heterogeneous instances, or just go pick ones that are relatively close to the same and put them behind a load balancer and, and start saving money. But final reminder, you know, Spot's one of our business models. If you're not making use of it, you know, in, in almost every case, there should be at least some instances uh, that you can save some money and run on Spot. But it's not going to solve everything, and there's one big point that the general manager of Spot wants me to make before I get off the stage is don't run your databases on Spot. <laughs> All right. Please don't do that. Um, please fill in the uh, surveys before you leave or via the app, however it happens. Um, they're really valuable in how we think about planning reInvent. Thanks, guys.